When Moses encountered God on Mount Sinai, that burning bush, and God said to Moses that he was to go to Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Moses asked God the question, whom shall I say sent me? And God said, tell them, I am sent you. In those two words, I am, God was saying, he's everything. Everything that his name, everything that is named, every need that we have, he is our provider, Jehovah Jireh. He's our peace, Jehovah Shalom. He's our healer, Jehovah Rea. Every single thing that we have need of, he is that. I am that I am. Come on, we're going to sing it one more time. It's such a beautiful song. It speaks of the names of God. And as we sing it, just think of him. Just think what you need tonight. Is it healing? Is it peace?
we may change. The situations in life may change, but God never changes. And we should not allow the situations in our lives to cause us to think that God has changed. He always is the same. Never changing God. God bless you richly. You may be seated. I'm in two books tonight, the book of Numbers, chapter 21, if you would turn with me, please. Numbers, number 21. And we are going to take up a verse of scripture in John, chapter 3. So if you find that those two texts, why don't you just shout hallelujah? hallelujah. So if you find those two texts, why don't you shout hallelujah? hallelujah. All right. <laughs> that sounds better. You know, when we come to church, you should be excited, huh? Yeah, we might be tired and weary and all that, but this is where we can get some sustenance from the Word of God, some encouragement from the Word of God, okay? So we want to be excited when we come into the house of God in spite of how we may feel. Chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord, verse 2. And said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Homer. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against Moses, against God, and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathed this light bread. They just said there was no bread. But their soul loathed the light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, this is Jesus speaking. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Precious God and Father, it is only by your spirit true understanding can come of your word. And so I pray tonight, Lord, that you would open our hearts and cause us to understand your ways as we peruse your word. 
cause us to understand that you do not think as a man thinks, that your ways are higher than our ways, as high as the heavens is from the earth, so that we may know, Lord, that no matter what comes our way, we can depend upon you, we can trust you, and we can have a faith in you. I pray, Lord, that you would do all these things for us through your word and spirit this evening, in Jesus' name. Our text begins with Israel, whose name was changed from Jacob. If you are Bible reading students, you should know that God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and it was through Israel, the nation of Israel, that was formed. And as we read, the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel when, God, when they said to the Lord, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then will I utterly destroy the cities. The Canaanites were the enemies of God. And they were occupying the land that God had promised to Abraham that his people would settle in. So in order to occupy that land, they had to drive out the Canaanites. And so it was when Israel came to that place, that particular place. They said, if you will deliver the people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And as we read, the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed their cities. Whenever I read of people calling out to God and God answering, I am so thankful that we serve a God who can hear. I am so thankful that we serve a God who not only hears, but a God who answers. And it goes beyond that, for he in invites us to call unto him, and he has promised. He has promised, and he's not a man that he should lie. He says, call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. I happen to know that when we call upon God, we call upon God expecting him to answer in a particular way. But as I have said so many times before, God does not answer us in the way that we think. He says his ways are higher than our ways, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So that when we call, don't expect him to answer the way you want him to answer. Just praise God that he's a God who hears, he's a God who answers, and believe that he will answer you. So aren't you glad tonight that we serve a God who hears when we call on him? Yes. I am sure as a result of Israel, Israel's victory, there was much rejoicing in the camp of Israel. When they utterly cast out the Canaanites from that place that they were in, I am sure that they must have danced and sung songs of praises, just like when God brought them from Egypt through the Red Sea. As we read in the book of Exodus, they sang songs and they danced. It was a great victory. God opened up the Red Sea and let them in, let them through. And when Pharaoh and company tried to go through after them, God closed the waters and drowned them all. And so there was much singing and dancing in Exodus 15, we read that Moses sang the song, Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Who is like unto thee? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Oh yes, it was a time of rejoicing. They rejoiced in the victory over the Canaanites. But then, look at your scriptures. Look at the text. We read in verse 4 that as they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, 
the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. What happened there was the Edomites, who were their cousins, refused to let them pass through their land. So they had to take the long way around. And it was a perilous journey. It wearied them. And so the Bible tells us that they were in a state of discouragement because of the way. They perhaps expected the way to be a smooth way. They expected that the way would be a way of victory after victory and blessing after blessing. After all, when they came out of Egypt, this is what they experienced for a while. So that when the way became hard, they became discouraged. And this is so true of us as children of God today. We are on a journey through life. We are journeying it through life. And it's, we are not going to get to the end of a journey until our spirits depart, our, soul, our bodies. But we have got to understand that on this journey, it will not always be an easy way. Yes, we may expect it. We are happy when it's easy. We are glad when things are going our way. We can rejoice and be exceedingly glad when things are happening our way, when everything is hunky-dory, when we have nothing to worry about, no one to trouble us. Well, that's a nice place to be. But you know that's not life. No, that's only an aspect of life. There are times when you are going to be discouraged because of the way. The Bible tells us that there is a time and a season for every purpose under the heaven. It's not always going to be a smooth way. There's going to be a time to laugh and a time to cry. There's going to be a time to weep. Weeping may endure for the night. But what? Joy cometh in the morning. So it's not always going to be the same way all the time. So we are going to have encouraging times as well as discouraging times. And as a people of God, we must learn. We must learn to handle the bad just as well as the good. I want to say that again. As a people of God, we must learn to handle the bad just as well as the good. If we do not learn that, we are going to be distraught when the bad comes. When disappointment comes our way, it's going to floor us if we are not learning to handle the good as well as the bad and the bad as well as the good. It's not always going to be easy as we go along life's journey. This was not so with Israel. For as we read, they began to speak against God. They began to speak against Moses. They questioned God as to why he brought them up out of Egypt. They questioned Moses as to whether he had brought them there to die in the wilderness. Why? Only because they were discouraged on the way. And what was their problem? As we read in the word of God, they were tired of being fed with manna from heaven. Could you imagine that? Not having to work, just to go and collect the food in the grocery. Not having to pay for it, just to pick it up and fresh every day. And yet they murmured about that. They were fed up with it. They wanted something more. A little hardship. And listen to me tonight. A little hardship blinded them from seeing the goodness and the mercy of God. You know, the Bible tells us, and it's a favorite text of mine from Romans, 
that these things were written for our learning. We need to learn from the things we read about in the scriptures. These things were written aforetime for our learning, that through them we might have hope and comfort in the scriptures. A little hardship blinded the Israelites from seeing the goodness and the mercies of God. And the same thing happens to us today in the body of Christ. How easy it is for us to forget what God has done for us only because we encounter a hardship or a problem. We tend to think that that hardship and that problem have changed God from being a good God. But he is good. He's a good God. And he's good all the time. And so God was not pleased with them. Take a note. Jehovah is the same today as he was then. We sang the song. He doesn't change. God was not pleased with them when they murmured against him. God was not pleased with them when they murmured against Moses. You say, well, pastor, but God is a big God. Why should he take that on? Well, you see, when we murmur against God, it is a sign of ungratefulness. It showed their ungratefulness. It showed up their lack of faith and trust in God only because they came to a time of hardship on the way. They completely forgot the Red Sea. They forgot the river that was bitter that they had to drink from. When God said to Moses, simply take a branch, throw it into the water, and the whole river got sweetened, they forgot about that. They forgot about the time when they, were, they ran out of water again. And God spoke to Moses, and Moses only had to strike the rock. And water gushed out from a hard rock to feed three million people. They forgot about that. They forgot about when they ran out of food, manna came down from heaven, the same manna they were complaining about. They forgot about that because of a little hardship. They forgot about the time when they were tired with the manna and they wanted meat. Where would they go at meat? Moses asked the question, are we going to slaughter all the animals we came out of Egypt with to feed all these people? And God said, just gather them together. And he called the quails. And the quails came and dropped themselves dead in front of them. They only had to pick up the meat. Man, they ate meat until it came out of the no their nostrils, as God said. And the Lord said, because he was displeased, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people died because of their ungratefulness, because they murmured against him, forgetting about his goodness. They complain, they accuse him, and God was not pleased. I want to believe today that we serve the same God who brought the people out of Egypt. I want to believe that he's a God who can be pleased and a God who cannot be pleased when we do things contrary to his will and his way. So he sent serpents among the people. And the Serpents, we read, bit the people, and much people died. That was the price they had to pay for their ingratitude. But before I go on with the message to us tonight, let me say to you, no matter what we may encounter on life's journey, no matter how it may turn, we must never let the enemy of our souls cause us to display ungratefulness. Never allow the enemy to cause us to display ungratefulness or unfaithfulness to our God. 
He is a gracious God. He is a gracious God, I said. He is a faithful God. Oh, you're not hearing me tonight. I am not asking for any amen. I'm saying he is a faithful God. Just agree with me. Whether we believe it or not, doesn't change the fact that he is faithful. And he doesn't change. God can never, there are some things that God cannot be. He cannot be unfaithful. He is a faithful God. So that no matter what we encounter in life's journey, we must never let the enemy of our souls cause us to display any form of ungratitude, ungratefulness, or unfaithfulness. Always hold up his goodness before your face. No matter what you're going through, always hold up his goodness before your face. He is a good God. And he's good all the time. The Bible tells us every good gift and every Perfect gift comes down from the Father of light in whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. Always remember from whence he has brought us. We must always keep this uppermost in our mind. No matter what we are going through, what we have got to face, always remember from whence we, he has brought us. And we didn't pay anything for him to bring us out of hell's door. Only by his grace, only by his mercy, only by his love. We did nothing to earn it or deserve it. Always see the price he paid for your salvation. No matter what you're going through, what we may be going through, always see the price he paid for our salvation. Always look at your final destination. Oh, God. We look at the things now. But look at what God has prepared for us. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He says, for our light afflictions, which is but for a moment. Well, he was exaggerating there. Eh? Because afflictions never last for a moment. But I understand what he means. In comparison to eternity, any affliction that we have, even if it lasts for 30, 40, 50 years, it is but for a moment when compared to eternity. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We should always be looking at our final destination. What God has prepared for us in the beyond. Oh, I know that's hard for us to grasp. I know we want to live now for now and we want everything nice right now. But it's not always going to be so. When the people saw the many others dying as a result of being bitten by the serpent, they came to Moses. The same Moses that they were bad talking. The same Moses that they murmured against. They came to Moses and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord and asked Moses to pray for them. If Moses were like any one of us, Moses would have let go the longest stoops the world could ever know. But he was a good shepherd. You see, the Bible is full of types, and Moses is a type of Christ. Just as the ark is a type of the church, and also a type of Christ, so too Moses was a type of Christ. Joseph in the Bible was a type of Christ. There are many, many types in the Old Testament as it relates to the New Testament. So Moses, being a good shepherd, 
in spite of what they said about him, in spite of how they murmured against him, in spite of how they felt about him, when they came and they asked him to pray for them, the Bible tells us that Moses prayed for the people. And God, the same God who they murmured against, the same God who sent the fiery serpents because he was vexed with them. And God said that he should make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole so that anyone that is bitten, when he looked upon it, will live. I don't know why God did it that way. I don't know. I, I see today the, 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 the medical insignia has two serpents wrapped around a pole. I don't know if it has anything to do with this text. But God said, this is the way we're going to do it. You're going to make a serpent, a fiery serpent, and you're going to put it up on a pole. And anyone that is bitten, if they would look at the serpent on the pole, they will live. So verse 9 tells us Moses made a serpent of brass and he put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. I want us to consider the fact that God, this same God, who when Pharaoh refused to let his people go, that he, God, spoke. And all kinds of things began to happen in Egypt, one after the other. Plagues, there were flies, there were frogs. There, was all, there, were, there, were, there were all kinds of things happening just by the word of God. God spoke and it happened. Could not the same God just to speak the word and remove all the serpents? Could he not do that? He's the all-powerful God. He's an unchanging God. He could have spoken just like when the children was coming out of Egypt. He could have done the same thing and all the serpents would have died. Alternatively, since the people repented and it was God's desire that they live, even after being bitten by the serpents, because that's what happened here, he, God, when they would have been bitten, could have healed them. Isn't that so? He could have healed them. He did say in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. So he could have done it either way. As a matter of fact, he could have done it many other ways. But he chose to have Moses build a serpent and put it upon a post so that the people looking at it would die. Would live, sorry. The point I am making here is that often we expect God to work on our behalf in the way we expect him. It seems logical. It seems just natural that this great God who could speak a universe into existence could have just spoken those serpents away. We tend to think that he is not working at all when he doesn't do things our way. But no, tonight people of God, loved ones. The Bible tells us that the God of Israel never slumbers, neither sleeps. And I don't believe that the father is pitching marbles with the son. 
I believe that he is working and he is working and working continuously, feverishly behind the scenes on our behalf. I choose to believe that. You could believe what you want. I choose to believe that when I call upon him, he answers and he begins to, to work. He says to me in his word, and I choose to believe him, that if I ask, I will receive. That if I seek, I will find. If I knock, it will be opened unto me. I choose to believe it. And that settles it for me. No matter what and how things may look at the moment. This is why I preach it all the time. Don't look at what's happening to you now. Keep your focus on the Lord. Believe in the Lord. Believe in the Lord. Just believe. So don't expect that God will do things the way we want him to do it. He said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Serpent biting you? Make a fiery serpent. Put it on a pole. But God, how it is that when we look on this fiery serpent on the pole, and the serpent bites us, we'll still live. How, how could that be? That's the point. We question God's way too much. We question God as to how he must do something, when he must do it, why he must do it. You know how many people I asked God to kill already? <laughs> and he ain't killed one. Instead of that, I could have swear he was going to kill me. <laughs> what I didn't realize is instead of dealing with the people, he was dealing with me. He's not going to work it the way you want it all the time. I have said this before, and I'll say it again, and I'll say it again and again and again. If we seek God to do something, and in our minds we expect it to be done in a particular way, and God had planned to do it that way, because we expect it that way, he's not going to work it that way. If our cries to him is not being answered in the way we expect, it doesn't mean that he is not working on it. Keep that uppermost in your mind. So now let's turn to our next text and see if we could understand what Jesus was speaking about when he said in John, John 3.14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. On the basis of this statement by Jesus, there are Bible commentators that suggest that the Old Testament serpent in our first text was a type of Christ in the new. There are commentaries that suggest this. But I dis disagree vehemently. I disagree with any commentator who will say that the serpent in the wilderness was a type of Christ in the New Testament. There is no way that a serpent can be used in typology to represent Jesus. There is no way. Because we all know what the serpent represents in the Bible. We all know who the serpent represents in the Bible. So there is no way I can see that serpent in the wilderness that God said must be upon a pole, that anyone look upon it will live, will be a type of Christ, so that when Christ is crucified there is a relationship 
Yes, there is a relationship, but it is not a type. Jesus used, and get a hold of this, please. Jesus used the serpent in the wilderness, not as a type, but as an analogy. This is what he used it as. Not as a type of, I don't know how people could associate a serpent with Jesus. A serpent represents the devil. In the book of Genesis, we read that the serpent was more subtle than any creature in the garden. And that the serpent is the one that beguiled Eve and got Eve to disobey God. And God said that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. How could it be that Jesus is a type or that serpent is a type of Christ? I believe it is Jesus was using it as an analogy. They resemble in some details, but they are entirely different. So what was the point in Jesus referencing Moses' serpent in the wilderness? What was that point? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. First of all, we must understand that the brass serpent in the wilderness had absolutely no healing virtues. The natural mind will want to think that if God says, put a serpent on a pole, and if you look at it and you get bitten by a serpent, you will live. The natural mind will construe that to mean that there is some healing virtue in the brazen serpent. But that is a far-fetched idea. There was absolutely no healing virtues in the serpent. And it was a far-fetched idea that anyone looking at a brass serpent would live when they would otherwise have died, having been bitten by a serpent. If you will believe that, I will not believe it. Could you? Could you imagine me making an altar call for the sick? And I said, tonight, this is how God is going to have me do it. I am going to take a glass of water. And anyone who is sick and will sip of this water will be healed. But that's not unfamiliar. Eh? That's not unfamiliar. You see, I, I, it was an analogy. <laughs> but, but like it working out somehow. Would you believe that? Would you believe that? You sure? Because there are people offering water for healing, you know. You're sure you wouldn't believe it? I am not just saying that it was not so that they would not live if they look upon the serpent. My point is that there is no healing virtue in the serpent of brass. It was their faith. Now, this is the message. It was their faith and trust in God, having said so, in believing that looking upon the serpent, it will cause them to live. It was their faith and trust in God. That's where the virtue was. When they believed what God said, not in the brazen serpent, but when they believed, because it's kind of far-fetched, why should I just go and look and at a serpent and another serpent, but, and I'm going to live? No, I'm going to make sure that no serpent bite me because I don't believe that that serpent could heal me. 
But when God said it, you see, there is a power in what God says. There is a power in what God says. As foolish as it may sound, if God says it, there is a power in his word. And God said to Moses, this is what you do. But there was no virtue in the brazen serpent. The virtue, the power was in believing what God said. It was their faith and their trust in God having said so. In believing that looking on the serpent will cause them to live, therein resided the healing virtue. In trusting and believing God that it would be as he said it would be. Now if you haven't gotten that, you missed the whole message for tonight. Because you're not going to see any brazen serpent here. You're going to see someone that was on a pole. His name is Jesus. <laughs> and what Jesus was using here as an analogy was that if anyone is so bitten by sin that coming to Jesus who was lifted up on a pole, as we say on a cross. It is in coming to him that we will, be, we will live having been bitten by sin because sin is very, very deadly. Sin is very, very deadly. So it was for this reason that Jesus used the analogy because in like manner it would be as a result of him being lifted up on a cross and anyone having been bitten by sin and looking to him, trusting in him, believing in him for salvation, then you shall live. This is what's the analogy there. And by the extension, anyone bitten by sickness, anyone bitten by any disease, and looking to him, trusting and believing in him for healing, will be healed. The power now shifts from the, just the belief with the serpent to believing in the person now. And the person has power, and the belief in him has power. So you have double power. You have dunamis. When we would believe, if we would only believe, if we would only trust, God wants people to believe him. God wants people to say, if he says so, it is so. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. I'm not going to look at circumstances. I'm not going to look at the situation. I am going to believe what God says. Anyone bitten by sickness and disease looking unto Jesus will be healed. Will be healed. By his stripes we were healed. We were healed. What does that mean? It means that provision, provision for our healing was made on Calvary. Provision for our deliverance was made on Calvary. Because Calvary is the place that provision for salvation was made. And salvation entails healing and deliverance as well. And this is what Jesus meant when he used it as comparing Moses Say, um, serpent in the wilderness. If you would just back up and see what Jesus was speaking about before he made this text. It was when that man Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and asked, was, said to Jesus, I know that you must be a man come from God for no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. And Jesus perceiving 
Nicodemus's question, even before he asked it, he says, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. He's speaking about salvation there. So as we follow the trend of thought, right down to the 14th verse, he's still talking about salvation. For and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must I, the son of man, be lifted up. Why? Because he is going to be the provider of salvation. He's going to be the provider of healing. He's going to be the provider of deliverance. He's going to be the provider of every need. Because he is Jehovah Jireh, the one who supplies all our needs. Why don't you put your hands together for this Lord tonight? So we're not lifting up any serpent here tonight. We're lifting up the Son of God. The one who left heaven's glory and came to earth and paid the price that we could not pay for a debt that he did not owe. To afford us salvation, to afford us healing, to afford us deliverance. He is Jehovah Jireh, the one who supplies all our needs. What is your need tonight? Is it going to be specifically for healing? No. Is it going to be specifically for deliverance? No. Is it going to be specifically for salvation? No. It's for whatever your need is. It's a buffet <laughs> tonight. Why don't you stand? And if you have a need, just make it here at the altar. I believe that God, the Spirit of God, works with the Word of God. He works with the Word of God. And when the Word comes forth, He says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He is Jehovah Jireh, the one who satisfies all our needs. He came, he paid the price. It was for this purpose the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the work of the devil. And the work of the devil is to keep man in sin, keep him in, away from salvation. It is to bring sickness. It is to bring disease. It is to bring wants and desires, that, that, that things that we need that he would withhold. Yes, God, this God, this God, this God can supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. But coming to the altar is not going to do it. God said to Moses, make a serpent, put it on the pole. He did not say, and everyone that is bitten will live. I want to run that again. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. God said to Moses, make a serpent and put it on a pole. And anyone who looks upon the serpent, that look must be one of believing what God says, trusting what God says. So you could be here tonight. And if you're here only because you want to be here, it's not going to happen. Only believe. Only believe. Only believe. Two words has so much power in it. When Jairus came to Jesus with his daughter who was dying and he asked Jesus to come and heal him and Jesus says, I will come on the way a messenger came and said to Jairus, don't bother the master. The maiden has died. Jesus looked at Jairus and said, 
only believe. That's where the power is. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. If the Israelites led to their own understanding, they would have never looked upon the serpent. But those that believed, they didn't die. Father, I lift up every man and woman, boy and girl standing at this altar tonight. You are the one who gave the word. You are the one who sent the word. You are the one who inspired the thoughts that were ministered here tonight. And I believe with all my heart, not doubting for any moment that your spirit works with your word. And I believe with all my heart, not doubting anything, that if there are those here that would only believe, it would be, as you said, it would be. I lift them up before you and I pray, Father. Every need, whatever the need, whatever the circumstance, touch them, Lord. Touch them by your power. Touch them by your grace. You have already touched them by your word. Now touch them by your spirit, Lord. Let the spirit work with the word that tonight the purpose for which they are standing here, Lord, the very purpose for which they are standing here, that you will bring it to pass, Lord, as they believe, as they trust you, not in their time, but in your time, not in their way, but in your way. Only believe. Loved ones, trust him. He's trustworthy. He is a trustworthy God. Don't let the enemy put doubts in your mind. Don't let the enemy put doubts in your heart. Only believe. There is virtue in believing what God says, that it would be so. Let's sing this chorus as I pray for these people. Could I get some help here tonight? Anyone here specifically for the purpose of healing? Just raise your hand right where you are. Okay, if you would just shift and come down here. Anyone here feeling discouraged, oppressed in any way? Anyone? Just raise your hand if you came in here discouraged and oppressed. No deliverance. It's healing. Everyone else with needs, just come on this side, whatever the need, apart from healing. Okay, I want, to, I want there, there to be a demarcation so I'll know exactly what I'm dealing with, okay? Precious God and Father, I lift up everyone before you. You sent your son, Jesus, into this world to pay the ultimate price for our salvation. We understand this so well, Lord, that salvation encompasses healing of sicknesses and diseases. And so I lift up everyone before you, and I pray, wonderful Savior and God, that you, the all-knowing God, who knows all things, that precious Lord, you will touch each one Touch each one, Lord, at the point of their need. I need not have 
to raise up the specific need before you. You are the omniscient God. You know all the things. And I will suggest that you who are the older, just place your hand on that part of your body where there is need for healing. And precious Lord, Precious Lord Jesus, you see the needs, you see the hands rested on the parts of their bodies where there is healing. And Lord, you said, if there are any that are sick among us, that they should be brought to the elders of the church, and the elders would lay hands upon them, anointing them with oil, and the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith will make them whole. The prayer of faith is when we believe that you are able to do that which we ask. And so, Lord, I pray, as they would touch their bodies, let their hands be your hand that touches them. Let their hands be an extension of your hand, your healing hand, Lord, to touch their bodies in the name of Jesus. And as they believe that this is so, cause them to know that it is so, that by faith they have received that which they have asked. For you have said, Lord, and you are not a man that you should lie, ask and we will receive. You said you are the God that heals. We believe, Lord. We believe and we trust you. Tonight, Lord, touch these bodies in the name of Jesus. For it was by your stripes, Lord Jesus, that you took upon your back at Calvary. It was by those stripes we were healed. And I thank you for it, Lord. I believe that it is so as we have asked. I believe it, Lord. And I trust that your people will believe that they would have the faith, the confidence in you, trust in you, not doubting, but believing. And I thank you, Lord, that we can expect we can expect, we can expect the healing for there is virtue in your word and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And precious God, as I look at this group, I lift them up before you. You know all things. You know each and every one need. I need not mention or ask them what their need is. I lift them up before you, wonderful Savior and God. And I pray that you, God, who are able, nay, Lord, more than able to supply all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, as your word says, I lift up these needs before you, Father, whatever they may be, trusting you. Believing, Lord, that you are able to touch everyone at the point of their need. This is my faith and this is my confidence in you. And I trust, Lord, that they will exhibit like confidence, like faith, like trust. Trusting you that in your own divine, wonderful, working way that you will touch each and every one at the point of their need. We are not to question how you're going to do it. We may formulate ideas in our minds, but precious God, you have told us that your ways are so much higher than our ways, that your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts, that we leave it entirely into your hands, Lord, not that you will do it the way we are thinking that it would be done. But you will do it your way. 
And we know that your way is divine. Your way is perfect. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you that as they believe, as they believe, as they believe, as they trust you with this, that you, God, according to your word, will supply all of the needs according to your riches in glory. Oh, we give you praise tonight, Lord. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Let's give him praise. Let's give him a praise. This is what the Israelites should have done. They should have praised him instead of murmuring. They should have praised him instead of complaining. Come on, let's praise him. Hallelujah.
those of you who were here for healing, how many of you received your healing tonight? Let me see your hands. Now, if you, if you have not received your healing, then you didn't believe. You see, it's not the manifestation. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence not seen. We receive by faith. You don't wait for the manifestation to receive. Manifestation is manifestation. Faith is faith. So if you have not received tonight your healing, you have not exhibited the kind of faith that you ought to have exhibited in believing that God is able. So you need to work a little more on your faith. Let me, I want to read a text for you in a while. How many of you don't, don't not because of what I said a while ago, but what you believe. How many of you believe that you have received the need that you have lifted up before the Lord? Let me see your hands. That's right. You believe that you receive. Now, let me read the text for you. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, have faith in God, that whatsoever, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them. Believe that you have received them. Don't believe that it's here now, but believe that you have received it. The God of Israel does not slumber or sleep. He's working on your behalf. It will come to pass, just as he says, if you will believe, if you will believe, if you will believe, if you will receive. I didn't intend to preach another message to you, but I had to get home the point. You see, we come to the altar and we think that because coming to the altar, that's it. And when we walk out the door, it must happen. No, you must, according to the word of God, believe that you have received. End of story. God says it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. I have received my need. I have received my healing. Amen. Now all I have to do is to wait for the manifestation. God bless you richly. You may be seated. If we would all stand. Oh, I told you be seated. Well. You're obedient people, that's good. If you're here tonight and you have been bitten by sin, as all of us have been bitten, sin separates man from God. And by one man's sin, we were all separated from God. In addition to which, we have all sinned and come short of God's glory. But Jesus came and he was lifted up on a cross. And the analogy here is that if we would come to him, if we would look to him for salvation, tonight you can be born of the Spirit of God, redeemed from the hand of the devil, cleansed of all sin and put on a road of righteousness 
a road back to God. This can happen to you tonight. Only believe. You've got to believe. You have to believe that God is able to change course in your life completely tonight by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Complete turnaround from the road of damnation to the road of salvation. From hell to heaven. From death to life. Would you bow your heads, please? You don't have Jesus Christ. You have never received Jesus Christ into your life. You have never been born of the Spirit of God. Jesus says it. Except that happens, you cannot enter into his kingdom. So if you're here tonight and you have never been born of the Spirit of God, you have never received Jesus Christ into your heart, just raise your hand right where you are. We will say a prayer for you and the miracle will take place. Come on, right where you are standing, raise your hand. Anyone? Anyone? Well, this is not something that we should be begging about. This is something that you would want to readily run and grasp so I'm going to take it for granted that we are all born of the Spirit of God but just in the event that you are not what you have just done is to reject the one who died for you I pray God that he will give you I pray God that he will be merciful and give you another opportunity God bless you you may be seated now Okay, let's sing a chorus and close. And oh, you have to stand again. <laughs> what do you want to stand? Let's stand, no? <laughs>
We serve a real good God, you know. A real, real, real good God. There is no other like our God. God bless you. You may sit now.